Welcome to the shooting show. This week we've got the first ever foxing field test of the Point 17 Hornet, plus expert advice on scope mounting. This week, Byron has got hold of the long-awaited 17 Hornet. Its inaugural foxing trip beckons, but first it's off to the range to get comfortable with a fast-flying, light calibre. I've been looking forward to tonight for a very long time. We're going to be taking the new 17 Hornet out after foxes. This is one of the first rifles to get out to a sporting journalist to really have a good play and test in the field. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it actually performs on live quarry. Um, I've shot it already today. Despite having quite considerable gusting winds, it shot very well. Um, took a little bit of time for the barrel to break in, but after about 10, 15, 20 shots, the rifle settled down. I was consistently returning three quarter inch groups. Um, so I don't really have a lot to complain about there. In terms of the kit, it's a pretty basic Savage rifle, this, um, but I've topped it off with some very nice Swarovski Z6 optics. So the one with the ballistic turret. I don't have all of this dialed in yet, but I've got it zeroed for what I need tonight. Um, the rifle's topped off with a Hardy Gen 4 moderator, which is distributed by Riflecraft and is one of my favourite moderators on the market at the moment. Now, the 17 Hornet in terms of ballistics pretty much replicates a 223 shooting a 55 grain bullet. Um, I've got this zeroed at uh, 200 yards, which makes it 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 inches higher at 100 yards, uh, and that should make it uh, between six and six and a half inches uh, low at 300 yards. We're not going to be shooting any further than that. I put a steel plate up um, earlier today, shot out at 300 yards just to see that I could do it and that the rifle was uh, performing the way I was expecting it, and it was absolutely spot on. All that's left now that I have it all zeroed and ready to go is to get out after some foxes. With the rifle now zeroed, Byron and Eden can head out at last. It's time to see if the Hornet can perform in the field. Rifle loaded, they set off, scanning the fields they know so well. They've only covered a few fields when they spot their first fox. The only fox they see that night, but tomorrow they will be out again. Day two and hunting buddies Stuart and Grant join the party. The first part of call is a test fire. You're happy with where it's shooting then? Yep. Good, good. Yeah, it's a very nice gun. Nice and light, no kick. You're not waiting for any recoil coming off it. Splattering an old yoghurt pot confirms Stuart is comfortable. Who needs expensive targets? With the rifle finding its mark, it's time for Stuart and Eden to head out in the vehicle. They quickly locate a pair of eyes, but it's not Charlie they've come across. Set eyes up there, deer. Nothing else comes in, so it's back to scanning and squeaking. Then they spot one. It's front on, and Stuart opts to wait for a broadside. Is he facing you? Aim on his nose. Should hit him in the chest. They wait and wait with the fox just sitting there. Eventually he makes a move and gives Stuart the moment he needs. In an instant, it's down. 
Oh, I got him right in the th right in the chops. Well, it's not too bad. I think he's maybe turned a bit. I was aiming about there, so he's been there, but I could have easily turned and taken a step forward just as I pulled the trigger. With one fox in the bag this side of midnight, there is a definite chance of another before the witching hour. They cover a good scalp of ground to no avail, but just as it seems the game is up, a flash of eyes gives up yet another fox. That bugger has gone up that up the edge of the field there, he was up. That's the same place he went when he was with Neil. Yeah. They speed into position in the truck and make the rifle ready. Stuart squeaks with Eden at the lamp. The fox is interested and comes straight in. He's coming right towards you. I want him to take him before he moves into the bay. Stuart drops his second fox of the night. Beautiful, Stuart. Beautifully done. That was brilliant. When we put the light back on, I couldn't see his eyes. And I scanned with the scope and then he was standing broadside right at the back of the house. I was like, well, I can't take a shot there. And I, I've got cottages all along there, so I didn't know, he wasn't going to go anywhere else better. Is it dark? Big, big dog. dog. Empty wound, he was facing me like that. Empty wound in there, exit wound. Coming out halfway down his back, it was through the front of him. Look at the teeth at the front, they're all chipped and broken. After a night without any joy last night, it was great to be able to get into two foxes tonight. Now, it's a little bit soon to say and evaluate exactly the performance of the caliber just based on two shots. Um, we will have to do that over a slightly longer period, but so far it seems to be performing very well. I have to say I was a skeptic when the caliber first came out, but I am slowly being won over, especially after seeing how it can perform out to 300 yards, seeing its performance on live quarry, and also actually firing uh, the rifle and the caliber itself. It really is sweet to shoot. I mean, it's a 20 grain bullet, so it is affected by wind considerably. Um, I'm still to get to grips with that. Fortunately, we've had some very still weather while I've been playing with it. Uh, in terms of energy downrange, to give you some sort of idea, you'll be getting about a quarter of the downrange energy at 400 yards than you would be getting with a 220 Swift. So it is a big difference, but remember that's 55 grains compared to 20. There's a lot more powder behind a 220 Swift. Um, I think there's a very good chance that the 17 Hornet is going to become a popular caliber in the UK, and we'll just have to see exactly how uh, it performs over extended periods of time and where it eventually settles into the market. Some frantic foxing from Byron and the boys there. And now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. Sporting Rifle magazine has announced that it will run its wildly successful Save the Rhino auction once again in 2013. The magazine raised £5,000 in 2010 and £10,000 last year and aims to beat that figure this year. Editor Pete Carr said the fight against rhino poaching was more crucial than ever, and this year's auction would be the biggest yet. 16-year-old Nathan Hales has joined the ranks of the top shooters, being named in Clay Shooting's Shooter of the Year awards. The Elise star, who won overall silver and junior gold at the World Cup in June, and recorded his first 100 straight at Skeet, joins the likes of George Digweed and Peter Wilson in the star-studded list. Also winning this year are the British Universal Trench team for their success at the World Championships, Ian Malarkey for his down-the-line double at the Prazzi and Kriegoff Championships, and Stuart Clark, World Sporting Champion. Beretta has announced details of its new 692 competition shotgun. The new model will replace the long-standing 682 and features Stelium Plus barrels, a wider receiver and the new BeFast balancing system. The 692 will be available to preview at the British Shooting Show and will be available in spring. For a full review, check out the latest issue of Clay Shooting. Farmland birds are at serious risk, according to new DEFRA statistics. Species such as partridge and turtle dove have seen massive declines in recent years, with grey partridge populations falling nearly 90% since 1970. The fall in the popular game birds' numbers is thought to have been caused by changes in farming that led to a shortage in food. More in the January issue of Modern Gamekeeping. More details have been released about what's on offer at the British Shooting Show. 
several companies have chosen the show to launch new guns, including Browning, who will be previewing the new A5 competition gun and a new straight pull rifle. There'll also be new models from Parazzi, Fabarm, Marocchi, Sacco and Kriegov. The show takes place at Stoney Park on the 9th and 10th of February. Book your tickets now at shootingshow.co.uk. That was the Shooting Show News. Okay. Next stage is to put the mounts on, ready to receive a scope. This one is a ticker, it's going to be fitted with a ticker Optilock mount. There's on the ticker there is a recoil lug on the forward mount and a hole to receive it here. I've already put the, the ring on. Screw usually goes to the left hand side, but check the instructions for your mount. That's with the lug in the hole and you push it till it's at the forward edge of the hole because as the rifle comes back the scope's going to try to go forward. If the screws are done up to their proper torque setting they shouldn't shake loose. So I actually just put a bit of dried lubricant on these, torque them on and there never seems to be a problem. It makes it an awful lot easier to get off. Torque setting, check for what the instructions say but it's usually in the range of 20 to 30 inch pounds. Next stage is to get your scope. In this case, it's going to be a Swarovski Z6 with a 30 mil tube. Now with the Optilock system, there's actually a synthetic insert goes between the mount and the scope, which is an excellent idea, but just be careful when you're fitting them, particularly on a cold day, they don't react well to the st being stretched. So it's always an idea to just warm them up slightly first and you just gently slip them on. Replace that in there so there's no metal work actually coming in contact with the scope. Now I'm going to fix it in place so it can't fall off but we want to leave it loose while we check that we get the scope straight and we get the proper eye relief. But just as a very rough rule of thumb, if you hold the rifle as you'd normally fire it if the eyepiece is roughly in line with where the knuckle joint on your thumb is, you're going to be near enough there. So we can see straight away, that's quite like nicely proportioned. You don't want the rings hard up against where the tube starts to flare out at either end or too close to the central turret mounts. Here we're more or less dead centre between the two, so it looks like it's going to be a good fit. Take the top of the ring, just be very careful at the moment because there's nothing holding that very nice scope onto the rifle. I often find it's easier to use the, the key supplied just to start things off. And it's just get it in a few turns. The scope's still movable, but it can't physically part company from the rifle. Make sure that the inserts are lined up and add the rest of the screws. Again, the key with all this, it's a precision instrument, not least it's an expensive piece of gear. Take your time. Don't rush it. Close your eyes, bring the stock up, and just take a normal, comfortable hold and open your eye. And the first thing I'm looking for is, have I got the correct eye relief between me and the eyepiece? I've not got a full sight picture. I need to crane my head forward a slight amount. So on this one, I want to bring the scope back slightly. And that's looking quite good. Just keep in mind, the position where you stood up, you're probably going to be another half to inch further forward as you lie down. Now I've got to set the vertical crosshair to be vertical in the mounts as I look through the scope. As I look through, it's slightly canted. You make course corrections, just a bit at a time. When you think you're about there, come away from the scope and you will still see the crosshairs as a shadow. And if you actually come away and follow the crosshair down, there's a slot here in the back on the ticker and you can basically make the two lines up and it usually makes for quite an accurate alignment. 
To my eye, that looks fine, but as I look back at it, the scope's slightly canted. So let's make a slight change, and that's fine. Next step, we've got the scope in, it'll still move, so we don't want to disturb it, is I slowly start to tighten. These mounts won't close completely, um, particularly with a, a, a very nice expensive scope like this. If you found you've not been concentrating and you've been using a very big screwdriver and you've proudly managed to get the two mounts to join together, something's probably gone terribly wrong. But ideally, you want the same size gap on both sides. And then the next stage is before you finally tighten, just double check that the scope is still straight. Sometimes as you tighten it will just pull it, skew it one side or the other. To finish off, using the torque wrench again, usually about 20 to 30 pounds. For these to respond very well to 25 pound inches. You again work round, keeping an eye on the gap and try and keep the gap e equal. And that's it. Scope fitted. Well, that's it for this year. Thanks for watching and see you in 2013. A happy new year from everyone on The Shooting Show.